Uh, Morris, uh, sorry because I uh, have to present uh, this seminar in Spanish. Uh, ok, bueno, uh, tengo el gusto de presentar el seminario de la licenciatura en matemáticas aplicadas, que es un seminario de divulgación e interdisciplinario que tiene por objetivo vincular a nuestros estudiantes de la licenciatura con investigadores, profesores y profesionales eh, en el mundo de la matemática aplicada. Eh, cedo la palabra a mi colega ay, me olvidó su nombre. <risa> Bueno, él sabe quién, mi colega, para, para, para ser, me haga favor de presentar a nuestro invitado de hoy, eh, que va a dar una plática al parecer por el mismo título y el resumen muy interesante, de Morris Seider. Muchas gracias, Jesús. Uh, and welcome everyone to this um, seminar. And today I'm very grateful to present Moritz Seidler. And um, he studied physics at the University of Potsdam in Germany. And then I think you did some research stay at Tel Aviv University as well. And, um, and he uh, did his master's in Dresden, also in physics at the Technical University of Dresden. And he did his master's thesis in mathematical biology. And right now he's working at the Social Democratic Party in the parliament of of the uh, free state of saxony in germany and uh, well thank you so much thank you very much for the introduction um i'm i don't speak any spanish at all so um, i'm i hope everyone is fine with english otherwise there's no real alternative i'll just switch to sharing my screen if you'll give me a second then you can see my presentation because then it's more fun if you can see it as well and not just I see it. Um, so I'll be speaking to you today on why I believe politics needs more physicists and why applied math math mathematicians are fine as well. But before I go into the details of that, because I'll be speaking a lot about myself in the next couple of minutes, Maybe is it possible that Jose, you hand the microphone around and I can sort of get an impression of the other people in the room, or is the Michael to cable connected? No, no, no. It's it's wireless. Yeah. 
So, so maybe if everyone I can just pass it around? say who they are and what their background is. So I have okay. an impression of whom I'm speaking to that will help me a lot. All right. Uh, hi, um, my name is Fernanda. I actually, I was studying physics and then I didn't finish. Uh, and now I'm studying uh, applied mathematician. It's such a pleasure and such an honor having this seminar. And I don't know if you want, I don't know, I think it's, 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 it's this Thanks. only. Hi, uh, my name is Lenin and I'm a fourth semester student, also uh, an applied mathematics major. And uh, nice meeting you. He's also uh, a fourth semester student. <laughs> He's also a fourth semester student. Hi, well, thanks for your topic, for your presentation. Uh, okay. A graduate physicist, and I'm studying mathematics, uh, graduate student. Uh, so mm, thank you very much. Uh, it's very in politics as well. So I uh, hope you give a good topic that I, I think that it would. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm, I'm Alberto. I studied uh, actuarial sciences and I currently do research in PDEs. My name is Marco, and I'm a professor here at the mathematics department. I work in neuroscience. Hi, my name is Carlos. I'm a first semester uh, physicist student. Hi, my name is Alberto. Uh, I'm majoring in deep learning in a postgraduate post study. I think that's all of us. Yeah. So thank you very much for taking the time. And of course, thanks for having me and for joining the, the presentation. I'm very excited to, to do this. I'd love to be in Mexico, but it's a bit far from where I am. And so I hope you'll apologize that it didn't fly all the way for the 60 minutes. So my talk will be divided mainly into two halves. And the first will be about what I used to do. And the second will be about what I do now. And I'll be skipping through a couple of topics fairly quickly. But if there's anything that you would be interested in more detail, if there's any questions you have, um, just maybe just ask them straight away, then we can sort of get into a discussion. Um, I'll have to ask Jose to sort of moderate that because I can only see a very small section of the people in the room because the frame is really small. And yeah. so, yeah, just, just pop in if there's anything you want to know more about. So first, what I used to do, this is the part that Jose already taught, uh, said a couple of things about in his introduction. I finished my bachelor in physics and astronomy at Potsdam University. Um, with the thesis analysis of confined Levi flights with Professor Ralf Metzler. Then I spent a semester abroad at Tel Aviv University and then graduated from Dresden University with a thesis on the model-based analysis of EGF-induced duetting of squamous cell carcinomas. And for the first half of my presentation, I'd just like to briefly go into that because even though it's been a couple of years since I've, I've worked on that, actually almost four years now, I still think it's really fun and it's a fun topic. So I'll just try to skip through that quickly um, because maybe it's an interesting topic for a couple of, especially the physicists there out there as well. And because I'm a huge fan of XKCD and I quoted him in my thesis as well, I'd like to start my presentation with an XKCD cartoon because I think what this cartoon shows is pretty, it's, it's a great summary of what physicists love doing and what I've been doing ever since I started, started studying physics. So. As a physicist, often we take concepts from physics, we take the mathematics, the models, the general concepts, and then we go to an entirely different field and apply it there. So I visited the presentation back in 2013 when I was a third semester student at Potsdam University. It was a presentation by Dirk Helving, he's a professor in Zurich. And although he's a studied physicist, he's a professor for computational sociology 
at Zurich University. And he spoke about how traffic jams are created and how um, uh, stock markets work and on how um, epidemics work and how they, they travel. So this was back in 2013. I never, I was really interested in the epidemics part. I tried to find a master thesis that would work with that back in 2019 or 2018 when I started. Unfortunately, I didn't find a professor in Dresden, which is sad because of course, after 2020, having written a thesis in epidemiology would have been really practical, but I did something else instead. I found a group in biology and I did the same thing there that Dirk Helbing did with sociology. So we take physics, we take mathematics and we apply it to biology in that case. So this is the actual live data that we were working on. It was, it's data from a group in Heidelberg which took cancer cells and they put them in Petri dishes in a flat round configuration. So it was sort of like a pancake shape. So what you see here on the left is the top view and then the, the two side views of the, the configuration of the cell cluster. Now what they did is they added EGF to this colony of, of cancer cells. EGF is just a protein, which is common in many biological processes. And then the cluster did something weird. So this is after adding EGF. What the all of the clusters did is they'd contract a bit. So you see the shape is no longer completely round. It's sort of distorted. It's a bit smaller. You can't exactly tell that here, but the evaluation shows that the clusters are smaller. And then there was one interesting thing. So the smaller clusters, they just contract as you see here in the, in the center on the right. The larger clusters, they did the same, they contracted, but they contracted much more and they bulged upwards. So you see here on the, on the, from the side perspectives, it's no longer flat cell cluster, it's actually bulged upwards into the third dimension. Now, why is this interesting? If you study cancer cells, there's six so-called hallmark marks of cancers which separate cancer cells from non-cancerous ones. And the interesting one is the black one on, at the bottom right. It's that cancer cells are able to invade other cell tissue types. And the thesis was, the, the theory was that this bulging upwards of the larger cell clusters might in some way be related to this ability of cancer cells to invade other, other tissue types. And now again, why is this a question for a physicist? Well, if you study the dynamics of that, obviously there, there, there are two ways this could go. So the cancer cluster could be aware of the fact that they're larger in some sense, obviously not in a neurological sense, but in some biological way that they actively do different things whether or not there's more or, or less cells there. Or the other possibility is that the individual cells behave exactly in the same way, only it's a pure mechanical effect that by having more cells, the effect is a different one. So my research question was whether all these observations can be explained as so-called emergent effects, which arise naturally simply by increasing the cell number or the amount of cells present. So what does a physicist do if he wants to answer this question? Well, we take a very complex system, which is cells and cell junctions, which I won't go into detail now, and we reduce this very complex system to a very simple model. In this case, simply two spheres connected by an elastic rod. Now, they're described mathematically by the position, then you give them an orientation and you describe the links by the tangentials and normals. So you do a lot of calculus with, with, with vectors. Um, which I won't go into detail again, because the more interesting thing is, or I find the way the rods behave. So you have the two spheres connected by, by the rods. And in one way you can imagine it to be a spring. So it has a standard length where it feels comfortable. And if you pull it apart, then there's a force pulling it back. And in the same way, if you push them together, there's a force pulling it, pushing it outwards again. So this is one thing you can do with these sort of handle-like shaped cell connections. The other thing you can do is you can bend and twist them. So they're in the neutral position, there's no forces, then you can bend them sort of by, by, by turning them from the top. And then there's a torque which pull them, them back just as a configuration would do in this, if it's a, like a normal elastical handle. You can shear them by not turning them, but pushing them apart onto parallel lines. And then there's a combination of forces and tor torques, and then you can, twist them from by grabbing them from the top. And again, there's a force or a torque trying to, to bring them back. And now if you do this, not with one pair of cells and rods, but a lot, 
then you get a system like this, which I call the Chirik Isai model because it's named by the, the two scientists from Hungary who first proposed it. And of course, this isn't enough because we want to see some sort of, of movement and behavior. So we need to turn this from an image into a model where the cell cluster is actually moving and, and, and behaving. And this movement is created by a three-step process where in every cycle, one of the, these links, these elastical rods can be removed or added. Then you change the length at which these, the, the springs feel comfortable. And then you let the forces work and let the, the model equilibrate itself. And then all the, all the cells will shift to some sort of a new position. And um, then after that happens, after everything's at ease as far as it will go, then you start the cycle again. And now, unfortunately, I didn't find a movie from the, the, the bird's eye perspective. I only have one from the side. This is a group of cell clusters without substrate. So it's only the cells spawned in the pancakey shape from the side in a, in a circle and they're suspended magically in, in midair. And now with this type of configuration, which behavior would you expect? Does anyone have a suggestion how, how the shape, what's the equilibrium shape that this might evolve into if it's a pancake of cells suspended in midair? Yeah. Any yeah. ideas? Yes, thank you very much. So we can observe this happening. They pull together and then one will just sort of randomly jump out of it. And then another will grab onto that and then they'll start pulling and then they'll, you'll see they, they pull each other into a, into a round circle as we watch time go by. So this is the model that I work with, trying to answer the, the question that I presented at first. Unfortunately, I never actually managed to answer the, the research question first posed because we were the second group ever to work with the model as far as we know. And I spent a lot of time with the mathematics of the model and the coding of the model, which I enjoyed a lot. Only then I ran out of time and had to finish my thesis before. Um, so to end the section with the second XKCD cartoon, because I think this is very uh, typical of um, the, the field of research as well, that if you go there as a physicist, um, and you think everything's easy because your model is fairly simple. Well, sometimes it just isn't that easy, even at the end. So this is where I come from. This is the, the research I was doing up until 2019. Similar things first in Potsdam, then at Dresden Technical University. And then I sort of left the path that I was on first. I am... Um, I had an, an, an option to, to, to do PhD at a technical university, but then I decided for myself that maybe physics isn't the field that's precisely for me. And so in the second half of my, my, my talk, I'll go into what I do now, which is also more related to the title of the, of the presentation. But before I go into the second half of my CV, I wanna take apart the, the logo that you've been seeing on all the slides here, it's on the top right. On the next slide, it's on the bottom right. So the SPD fraction of Sächsischen Landtag is where I work now. And so this is Germany, similar to Mexico. Germany is a federal state. We have 16 states. Three of them are just big cities. They're their own state. I think Mexico City is like that as well. Um, and yes, the others, like that. Yeah. And the other 13 are actual country states. And one of these 16 states is Sachsen. Saxony, um, the capital is Dresden. So in the logo, that's the middle line on the right side. Sächsisch is the adjective. And the way all these states are set up is that in the logic of the German federal system, the, 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 standard, um, the standard person or the standard organizational level in charge is always the lowest one. So the, the, the default responsibility always lies with the cities unless the states are responsible, who are responsible unless the federal level is responsible, but the default is always the, the state. And so we have a multi-layered system of government where you might be familiar with parts of the federal government. I don't know if you're familiar with Olaf Scholz, who's the German chancellor. 
you probably have heard of Angela Merkel, who was the German chancellor up until 2021. So she's the head of the government of, on the federal level. We have a president as well, but he's not very important. He's sort of like a, he does representative stuff, sort of like the British king, only that we vote on him or parliament does. So we have a parliament, we have a judiciary, and we have a government on a state level, on a federal level, and we have the same thing on a state level and the same thing on a city level. And on the state level, these parliaments are called Landtag. This is the Saxon parliament, the Landtag in session. So that's the third, the bottom line on the logo, the Sächsische Landtag being the Saxon state parliament. And the members of parliament in the Landtag, they're organized into groups like in the US system, you have the, the Republicans and the, and the Democrats. I'm not familiar enough with Mexican politics to name any parties there. Mm -hmm. um, and in the Saxon state parliament, we have more than the US does, we have five of these, of these groups of parliamentarians. In German, they're called Fraktionen. Um, I don't know the exact English translation. Sometimes it's translated to factions, sometimes to caucus. And the five Fraktionen in the Saxon state parliament are the, in the blue on the right is the AfD. It's the right-wing extremist, radical, I'd say racist party, which is disturbingly strong in, in Saxony. It's stronger here than in any other state in, in Germany. Then in the center in black, the largest group is the so-called the CDU, the Christian Democratic Union, which is the largest conservative party. It's the party that Angela Merkel comes from as well. And then there are three smaller parties, the Greens in green, obviously. Then the, the light red is the SPD, the Social Democratic Party. Oops. And that's the party I work for. And then there's a left party, which is called the left party because they're really far left politically. So this much sort of for the, about the, the setup of the parliament in, in, in Saxony and whom I, I work for on like a meta level. So I work directly for the group of, of parliamentarians elected by the SPD. So to the second half of my CV, the stuff that I did when I didn't study physics. First, I was very lucky to be granted a scholarship with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. The Friedrich Ebert Stiftung is a political foundation in Germany, which does two things. So on the one hand, they're a political think tank and they publish papers on political ideas, on, um, it, on, on, on concepts, and they, 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 they suggest how politics could be done on a very abstract level. And the second thing they do is that they fund students from any field for their, for their studies and they fund them and they enable them to go to seminars. So they take students from all different fields, from medicine, from law, from, from physics, mathematics, from politics, whatever you can imagine, they put them together into seminars and they enable debates on whatever topics there might be. So for me, this was a very valuable experience because I was, I always enjoyed physics. I loved mathematics, I loved coding, but I always missed doing something which seemed more practically relevant to society on an immediate level and more related to people. And so in these seminars with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, we had debates on political topics and I could satisfy that half of my, my interests already during study, my studies in physics. And then shortly before I finished my degree, after I'd finished all my courses and before I started on my thesis, I sort of became afraid because I thought if I start my thesis now, then I'll be finished in a year and then I'll have to know what I'm gonna do next. And that scared me. So I decided to take a gap semester and do a couple of internships. And one of these internships was with Daniela Kolbe, who was then a member of the federal level parliament. And then thanks to that internship, I managed to get a student job with Martin Dulich, who is a member of the parliament on the Saxon state level. I worked for him until I finished my, my degree. And then I thought, well, I'd have a fun summer and wait for my PhD to start in, in autumn. 
Then that summer was election summer though, and they offered me a job to work as a campaign assistant for the party. So I thought, okay, summer happens every year, election campaigns don't, so I'll do this instead. Thinking that then the next step would be starting my PhD. And then they offered me a job to work in the parliament as a, as a parliamentary assistant. And ever since 2020 now, I've been personal assistant to the chairman of this caucus of the SPD Fraktion im Sächsischen Landtag. So to go into a bit of detail about what that actually means, um, I'll start with the person I work for. This is him. Dirk Panther, as I said, the chairman of the SPD group. Um, he's a member of parliament from, he originally comes from the southwest of Germany. He's been living in Leipzig though, the second large city in Dresden, in Saxony next to Dresden. And um, he specializes, apart from being the chairman on finance subjects, on um, uh, digitalization and on media politics. So this is who I work for. And this is, well, obviously not me. Um, does anyone know who, who this is and have an idea why his image is here? Who's into Netflix? Is he Doug Stamper from House of Cards? Yeah. He's Doug Stamper from House of Cards because often when people ask me, so what do you actually do? I find it really hard to explain the the, the day to day aspects of my job, and it's I find it hard to explain to other people what, what being a personal assistant actually means. But lots of people have seen House of Cards, and my job is sort of being Doug Stamper, only that I'm nice and I'm not violent and I don't do illegal things. Um, but in a sort of way, my job is what Doug Stamper is in the first season of House of Cards because my boss is, doesn't compare exactly because the parliamentary systems are different, but my boss is sort of like the whip that um, Frank Underwood is at the beginning. And I'm in charge of um, assisting him. So Doug Stamper is chief of staff. I'm personally not exactly the same, but his role is somewhere in between. So what does a personal assistant do maybe on a, to, to, to try to be more concrete about? So the first thing is that we serve as bonus brains because these people like Frank Underwood and like my boss, Dirk Panta, they run from appointment to appointment. They, they're super, super busy and they often lack the time to sit down with a cup of coffee, stare at a wall and think about something for two hours straight. And so that's part of what I do is if my boss has an idea or if someone talks to him and says here, this is a new concept that you might like to try out. Well, then it's my job to sit down with the coffee, stare at a wall and think about whether this might work, if there are any catches that we haven't seen and help him do stuff for which he just doesn't have the time. Then we act as gatekeepers and problem solvers. This is most of what Doug Stamper does in, in House of Cards. So obviously, if you're a politician, lots of people will want to talk to you. And this part of the job has gotten harder in the last years because like 20 years ago, if people wanted to speak to a politician, they'd send them a letter or they'd call their office. And then people like me would say, okay, you can talk to him or we'd arrange an appointment or something. Whereas now politicians have their own mobile phones, which is really annoying for personal assistants because if they have their own mobile phones, then they'll take calls and they'll call other people. And it gets really hard to track what they actually do. And they'll get lost on doing things which I find less important, but I guess that's something we can solve. So we act as gatekeepers, trying to make sure that the relevant information reaches and we the, the politicians and we filter out the information and the requests for appointments, which just would lead to an overflow of, of the calendar and the capacities of one person. Um, and yeah, problem solver, obviously, um, if there's an issue that has to be solved, then one person can hardly solve them all. So that's what personal assistance helps with. As I said, we manage in not going letters, emails, calls, etc., because um, managing your own calendar starts to get really complicated if you're a politician. Then one of the most interesting parts is that we assist in negotiations and other aspects of 
lawmaking because again laws are really long like a sh short one might be three or four pages if it's a fairly easy concept um, but at the moment there's negotiations on a really complicated aspect of paying state employees so it sounds really boring and i find it really interesting but it's a 400 page law so someone has to read it and there comes the bonus brain aspect again so the first thing we do is we read this and then summarize it and try to suggest what next steps might be what are aspects that might be changed what are problems in the law and help develop strategies and then in negotiations, usually you have the politicians and then you have a group of staffers sitting there um, where we help. And usually we don't lead the negotiations, but we'll be texting our bosses and saying, well, do this or make sure to watch out for this. And then we help them evaluate that. And then we coordinate appointments. We prepare briefings for appointments and all of that. Now, having held the first half of my presentation, and now presented this half of my presentation, the obvious question is, what does that have to do with physics? Well, and the brief answer is nothing much or almost nothing. But still, I want to, I, I still believe that having physicists and mathemati mathematicians in, in politics makes sense. Why? Well, for one reason, there's a couple of problems which you can just solve in completely different ways if you've studied physics and mathematics, which arise in politics. And most other people working in politics don't have the correct tools to, to answer these questions. And I'll, I'll go into one example in a bit more detail. So I apologize, I apologize for the, the German here on the sides. I didn't have the time to, to correct the, the access labels, but I'll, I'll explain what this is. So. One of the most important thing that every parliament does is that it votes on the budget. And so it decides what are the topics that a country can spend or a state or a city can spend its money for. And if you want to know what you can spend money for, the first step is that you need to know how much money will I be having this year? How much money will be, there be next year, the year after, et cetera, et cetera. And the question is everything but trivial. So what Germany does, and I'm sure Mexico does something similar, although I don't know, is it has a couple of pretty clever, smart people, economists sit down and predict how much taxes and how much other income will Germany be making this year, the next year, the year after, et cetera. Like they, they usually do on a four to five year scale. So this is the data from 2011, where they said in 2011, this is federally calculated, but on a Saxon level. So the federal government said that Saxony, be, Saxony will be making in 2011, a bit less than, than 10.5 billion euros. In 2012, it'll be something above 11 billion and, and so on. So this, these calculations are, as I said, are made by the federal government. Now what the Saxon government does is they take this data and they say, ah, we don't trust the federal government. They ignored a couple of aspects and we think they're wrong. We think actually this will be the data. So as you can see, it's much less. Why is this an issue? Well, it means that you'll there, there, there's a much less money that you can spend on political projects. And as I showed you before, the strongest party in Saxony is the CDU, the Conservative Party. And I believe it might be similar in Mexico as well. That the, the Conservatives are more, they, 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 they sit on the money and they're less happy to spend it. And they're what makes them happy is that at the, at the end of the year, um, they, they manage to save some euros or some dollars or whatever currency the, 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 the politicians are, are calculating in. Whereas at the Social Democratic Party, we believe that having a lot of money as a state is no value in itself because the state's money is there to help people to improve the quality of roads, to improve the digital infrastructure, to make sure that everyone can be schooled properly, um, to set up a strong social security system. And if we want to do that, for us, it would be helpful if there's, of course, if there's, there, there's more money. So we believe that the Saxon finance, finance minister uses mathematical and financial tricks 
to make the state look poorer in the predictions so that at the end he has more sort of cushion money for everything to go out. So the, these are the predictions. The blue is the federal prediction. The green is the Saxon state prediction. And this is the actual result. So the assumed corrections that Saxon needed, did there are wrong. And they, they, they correct into the wrong direction. Now we have this data, not only for 2011, we have it for a lot of years. So this is the same graph, just I used all the data that I had. We had it back to 2010 available easily. And, and I think I did this in 2020, mid 2022. So this was the data available then. And so sort of if you look at that, you can see that the green lines, they sort of always go in the wrong directions and the blue ones are closer. So just by looking at that, we could say, well, so the finance minister is probably wrong about his corrections. Only it's hard to prove that this, so you can play around with that and do some sim simple calculations. And what this graph does is this is the mean error of the two types of predicting the tax revenue, the, the, the money available. And as this shows very clearly on an average, especially on the, the long run prediction, the conservatives are bullshitting the, the state. And you see this in the results as well. Every year at the end of the year, Saxony has money left over. Now, of course, the mathematics behind this are super simple. This is addition and subtraction um, and di dividing it by the number of years. So for a mathematician, this isn't interesting at all, but still it, you, working with the amount of data that this is and figuring out the concept to calculate this is something that most politics students and most colleagues working in the SPD Fraktion just don't have the skill set to to do. And now, of course, this is a very this isn't my day to day business. This is like the the example that of my work, which fits it's the closest fit to what I what I studied, because most subjects are much harder to put into numbers and to put into tables and to put into into graphs. For example. Um, uh, one issue that is big in German politics at the moment is, is refugees, because um, there's been a, a very strong jump in the number of refugees arriving in Germany ever since February, March of 2022. Does anyone have an idea why? Why? Yeah, exactly. Because ever since Russia attacked Ukraine, um, of course, lots of Ukrainians have been fleeing Ukraine. And then if they go westwards from Ukraine, the first country many of them will come to is, is Poland. And then if they go westwards from Poland, then the next country they'll come to is Germany. And the states, if you remember the map of Germany I showed you at the beginning, one of the first states they'll reach coming from Poland is actually the first next to, or, yeah, it's two by the Polish border, one of them is Saxony. And so there's many refugees, many refugees arriving in in, in Saxony and Saxony has a reputation of being far right, not very friendly to, to refugees. So it's hard to, it's, it's, it's a big discussion with many people who aren't very welcoming towards refugees and actually welcoming re Ukrainian refugees is easier because they're seen as more European, whereas the same, or the much smaller numbers of refugees arriving from countries like Afghanistan, arriving from, from Syria, which was the largest number of refugees eight years ago, they're much harder for many Saxons to, to accept. So one issue is the, the political sociology one of how do we act with protests of people who don't want refugees living in their cities, who don't, don't want foreigners living in their cities. Then the second aspect is a financial one because and taking in refugees, the first at first it costs you money because you have to supply them the housing with with the basic amount of of money. And so all these questions, just as an example of these are things we're debating at the moment, how we can aid refugees in arriving and how we can help the cities in 
how, giving them enough housing. And it's hard to put these things into numbers and to put these things into graphs. So as I couldn't make a neat graph like this with, with these political issues. And then again, why is a physicist relevant in politics apart from this? Well, I believe that as a physicist and as an applied mathematician as well, we have a specific set of soft skills which help us in almost any other field. The first thing is perseverance and resistance towards stress. So uh, the person I knew in Potsdam University, he graduated and then had a 40 hour just like full-time job and complained that he didn't have enough to do and he was bored because coming from his physics major full-time job just seemed too easy for him. The thing that I like to highlight most is learning to think logically and critically because, and yeah, I think it goes well with the, with the next point, the ability to dis disassemble complex problems into more easily solvable ones, because that, that's exactly what you do, especially in mathematics and in physics. If you have a complicated issue, or at least that's how, how I study physics, the first thing you'll do is you'll try to disassemble it into something you already know. Because if you can figure out like a semi wait, wait, sub structure, um, I think there is a problem with the audio. Give me a sec. Sorry, sorry. Give me a sec. Okay. Can you talk and to see if it works? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Or is it still struggling? Is it an issue on my side or on your side? Again? Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm um, trying to talk but I don't think you can hear me. Yeah, not very well. I mean, we can hear that you're speaking, but we cannot understand what you're saying. Um, but it's from our side, it's not you. So can you speak now, please? Yes, can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, now it's perfect, sorry. Okay, perfect. So 
Yeah, the soft skill that I was talking about is logical and critical thinking, because I believe that the way physics and mathematics is taught, the first thing you do is you try to take a big problem and then you take it apart into problems you've already solved before, because then you know the answer, so it's much easier. And in many subjects, especially if they're very words focused, you can sometimes just bullshit yourself through it by talking a lot. And I think physics and mathematics are very non bullshit subjects. And I think that is a skill very useful in politics as well. I've noticed it very often in discussions with, with, with other colleagues that being able to reduce a complex problem to its basics, its essence, and then working with that is very helpful sometimes. And I think I went through a very tough but very helpful training during my master's and bachelor's degree there. there. Then another thing that is useful sometimes is now my slides are stuck. There. and not being afraid of numbers because politics is lots of words but especially if it comes to finance and budgets it's numbers as well and if you're not afraid of them that's helpful and finally like a certain degree of it affinity is helpful in any field and it is in in politics as well and so sort of that brings me back to the xkcd cartoon that i started with because in a way i still do the same thing the, that I've been doing since since 10 years, even though I started off in physics and now I'm in politics. But I take the skill set and the models and the concepts that I learned in physics and I apply them to something different. And that first I apply them to biology in a very concrete manner. So I used the actual mathematics and applied them to biological questions. And now in my job, I don't use the mathematics anymore. But what I do use is sometimes I use some of the coding, not often though. But I use the soft skills that I learned in my degree and in seminars that I visited sort of surrounding my studies and in activities that I joined. And so that's the one, to, the main essence of what I want to, want to tell you, the, the take home message that your subjects are very, very important. And the, the hard facts that you learn in your degree are important for your career and where you go to. And for many of you, if you stay in, in science, and they'll be the basis of what you do. But your soft skills are easy to overlook, but they're just as valuable as your hard skills, even if you're a physicist or a mathematician. And I would like to encourage you to, to value these soft skills and to become a bit more aware of them and also to value the, the time that you might spend into expanding on these, these soft skills so that if you visit seminars and visit discussions and are join political groups or other organizations there's a lot you can learn in there it's not a waste of time it's something that you can learn that expands your knowledge and your skill set which might be useful at some point later on in your life if you're in physics or mathematics these things might help but it might be enable you to decide at some point decide well physics mathematics they were fun subjects but i wanted to go into something completely different now. And that might be computational sociology and maybe it's politics or maybe it's something completely different. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and close my shared screen so we can open it up to questions or discussions if you would like to go into that. Are there any questions? Okay. Well, can you hear me? Um, I hope I'm not turning aside too much, but I would like to to learn about ethics, ethics in physics and mathematics because around the history, we have been doing important results and important things. However, the path or the yeah the way that science is taken. I'm I'm not really sure how can we can do something. <laughs> what would you say to to the youth to to help in an ethic way? How can we help politics besides the the skills of resistance and perseverance? Mm. Well, <laughs> thank you for the question. First, it's actually a question I love a lot because. Um, one of the, the things that I did at, when I was a bachelor student at Potsdam University is I, I started discussing exactly these questions with fellow physicists because 
um, I think that thinking and discussing the implications of research is something that physicists don't do enough. And what we did then is we started a, a group which held discussions at Potsdam University exactly on these issues. So we had three fairly large discussions where we invited guests and invited people from Potsdam University to discuss the, the ethics aspect of science. And then we we convinced two professors to do a seminar on, on exactly this, where they'd go into sort of the philosoph philosophical aspects. And these issues are tricky fairly often because you, in many cases, you, you, you can't tell how the, the, the research will, will turn out. Um, because you, the, the, the key word is dual use, you can use it for everything. The, the classical image is the knife. You can use a knife to spread butter on your bread and you can also use a knife to, to kill someone. And so that's a tricky question to answer, but I think it's very valuable to, to talk about it in, in the sciences. And then not only to talk about it in the field of science, but also to talk about it with other people. And there are many scientists who say, well, I don't wanna get involved in politics. I wanna do my research. I want to publish my research, but I don't want to get into the discussion and the public discussion on the implications of my research because politics would many people have a bad, has a bad reputation. People will say politics, is, it's a dirty field. Um, people are, politicians are corrupt. Politicians are lazy, all these, these cliches. And many scientists, I think might be afraid that if they, they get involved into political discussions, then that'll discredit their scientific work, which I think is, wrong and I think it's a dangerous perspective because the, the of course the the most obvious example is is climate research where politics just doesn't work without the input from from scientists and we need scientists to make predictions make accurate predictions to help convince people to change their their, their way of lives because changing way of life everyone likes to continue doing what they did in, in most cases if they're happy if they're comfortable then they'll just go on with that as before and changing things giving up your car no longer flying in for a vacation giving up eating meat all these things are are, are hard and it needs scientists in there and so i think one big contribution that you as scientists can do is to lead discussions with one another and to not be afraid of politics so either you go into politics yourself with a scientific background like angela merkel the former german chancellor she was a physicist as well or you try to convince politicians that they have to change something about what they do and to help convince people and um, uh, you can go to climate protests if you're a climate researcher um, all these all these things i think scientists should be encouraged to play a more active role in political discussions and not be afraid i hope that answers your question that the very ethics is a very broad thing and you can it has many different connections with with science so yeah, yeah. there's something else that you wanted to know no no thank you so much <laughs> And with, if maybe if there's like one last, last thing I can say to that. So as, as I showed you before, the SPD in the Saxon State Parliament, it's 10 members of parliament. And we have a staff of maybe eight people like me. We can't do everything on our own. We're, we have think tanks that we talk to. We have scientists that we talk to, which play around with different models and concepts. And a lot of what we do is based on these, these concepts by scientists. So we'll, we'll speak to people we trust, whose judgment we trust. We'll take a look at what they do, and if it makes sense, then that will turn into politics. So politics just doesn't work without scientists in some way. Sorry. Hi, I have uh, two questions. One is, are there many other mathematicians and physicists in German politics around you? Do you see other people with your background or you're like the exception? That is one question. And the second question is, for someone who just finished a master's or a PhD, and has never had any contact with any political party. Do you have any advice on how he can get near to this world of science and politics? Thank you. So on the first question, well, we're not a complete exception, um, but of course the default is something else. I don't know about Mexico and Germany. The default is that most people studied law or politics um, or maybe sociology or something related. Those are 
or many teachers become politicians for some reason. Um, so they're, they're very common. As I said, Angela Merkel was a physicist. Um, I don't know if you're still familiar with Javier Solana. He was the NATO general and I think the Spanish foreign minister. He's a physicist as well. Um, in the Saxon state parliament, there's a couple of engineers amongst the members of parliament. Um, there's one informatics PhD graduate. Um, and in the staff of the SPD fraction, I'm the only physicist, but then there's another, um, he studied informatics, the second one, and then a chemist. So that's sort of the, the setup here. So it's it's not completely uncommon, but um, there's not that many of us. And it goes that far that if I say, if I tell anybody that in Germany, I'm a physicist working in politics, the first thing they'll say is, ah, then you'll be the next Angela Merkel because she's the only physicist in politics they know. Which doesn't make sense because I'm not on that side of politics. I'm not elected, I work there, but yeah, whatever. And then for the second question about um, how first steps and first contacts into politics might work. Well, for me, there were three contact points. The, uh, the, the first was student groups. So as I said, we founded a group at Potsdam University of Students where we encourage discussions um, on ethical subjects. And we work together with, I don't know if you have like a student governing body at your university. Um, so in Germany, these systems are, are very, very common. And in most committees on a university level, there's one or two student representatives involved as well. And so we worked with these student representatives. Then you have the you have youth groups for parties which are involved in university politics as well. Again, I'm not sure how common this is in, in Mexico, but they're in, in Germany. So each grown-up party will have a youth movement, and these youth movements are present in universities. So you can go to their meetings and talk to them. And it doesn't mean that you have to join immediately. Mo most of them are, from my experience, very open just to, to speaking to people, having discussions with them. Um, and then another thing you can do is just volunteer for an internship or something completely out of your field. Um, I was ejected for a lot of internships I applied for because they said, well, physicist, why do we want him? And then one of the members of parliament um, said, okay, why not? Well, actually, she's a, she's a physicist as well, so maybe that's why. But I think it's always worth worth trying and, and, and giving it a shot. And the major thing you have to be is just be curious and not care about the fact that on paper you don't fit in because I believe that you bring much more than the people on the other side might expect from you. Thank you. Um, are there other questions? No. Hi, I have two questions. Uh, the impulse of science public policies are part of the party's culture, it's something that the German society demands. And my second question is, how's uh, the running negotiation of public parties and uh, public uh, policies and how politicians are uh, open to accept this public policies based on mathematical data and modeling things that how politicians uh, are open to accept models to plan and design public policies. Thank you. Well, sorry, could you just repeat the first question? I didn't uh, quite understand the first one. Uh, well, like in, if the science culture of the science uh, development in the, at the government level in Germany is something that come from, from the culture party, from the parties, or is it something that the German society demands, like they, the German people demand some policies in, in science, or there is something like part of the of the German parties? Um, so I'll, 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 the, it's a very broad question. I'll try to answer. And then maybe if, if uh, there's part of it still open, then you can just try to go in a, a second time. So for the, for the first question, 
um, I believe that science and universities play a very large role in German society in, in general. Um, so both for the people, it's important because obviously many people want to go to university, so they'll demand good conditions, good, enough money for the universities, good conditions for people working or studying at university, um, so bursaries, etc. cetera. Um, and for the parties, it's a big issue as well because you need universities for many, many things. For example, every large city in Germany has a university because the university causes young people to move there and then they'll stay. And so you have industries surrounding the universities. And if you have industries in the city and companies, factories, et cetera, working, working there, then that generates more tax income for the city or the state, which means that then you can fund other policies. So both the society and the country and, and the parties are interested in, um, in, in, in some, encouraging science in a way. But of course, at the end, budgets are restricted and it's always a fight between the different fields. So, um, yeah, but I think that Germany is a fairly science friendly country. So um, that was the, the first question. And the second about politicians being open towards science. Well, it's hard to generalize. There's both, of course, there's some which are very open to, to discussions with scientists and there's some which aren't. Your chances are better if you want to prove what the politicians already believe, because then you give them arguments. Whereas if you want to convince them of the opposite, then it's much harder. But I don't think politicians are an exception in the, that case. I hope that answered your questions. I'm sorry. Yes. 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 Hi. Um, I have also a question. It's like uh, more related with. Which uh, three subjects of uh, maths and physicist, uh, well, uh, physics do you think are like more used to be in demand in politics uh, right now? And how do you think you can um, like learn them? Um, and, and that's almost it. <laughs> well, the first big subject, of course, is climate physics and meteorology, um, because I just believe that that's, and I'm sure you'll agree, but one of the, the big issues that society has to figure out a solution for. And it's also something that as a physicist, you can get into fairly easily because modeling is full of physicists. So if you're interested in mathematics and in IT, so you should learn to code, that's important. Because so the, the, what I like about physics is that the skill set is so broad. You learn a lot of mathematics without being complete mathematics nerd. You learn a decent amount of IT without being too nerdy into the technical aspects. And you learn how to, to take a problem and then abstract that to simplify it into a simpler, simpler model. So if you take this skill set, then I'm sure that it'll be really easy to go into climate physics. For example, I know a friend of mine from, from Dresden, she did quantum physics for her master's thesis, and now she's a climate physicist in, in Bremen for her PhD. Apparently, it worked really easily. Um, so yeah, climate physics would be the, the one big, and then everything else is so much smaller that it's hard for me to go into detail. Of course, coming from where I come from, I'd like to say cancer research and medical research is important. Um, of course, medical things are, are good. Plus, of course, there's lots of money in medical research, at least if it's not too far from applying it into, into pharmaceutical things. Um, but economy might be another field. Yeah, it's more than two. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, don't worry. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your topic. Very interesting and uh, I have two questions. One, uh, what's the role of uh, physicists and mathematicians? Or what role uh, could them play into, uh, let's say, automate uh, the decision making in order to improve the efficiency of a nation state, uh, to have a kind of uh, an automatic uh, 
state uh, just in order to reduce the biases and all the the human uh, corruption, let's say. And the second one, uh, sorry, uh, kind of ethics for operational research to the public administration and to administrate all the, the public policies. And the second one, uh, substantial, uh, a tangential question, but what's your opinion about the role of Angela Merkel as a uh, as a politician with a scientific background, uh, applying the denuclearization program. Uh, two very big questions. The first I find hard to answer because I don't, I, I disagree on the base, this, the, the basic assumption of your question. I don't think that optimizing politics would be helpful because of course it helps fight corruption on that level, but then the corruption would move somewhere else because all rule-based decision-making is based on rules and automated decision-making is based on rules. So then the corruption would shift to the people coding and making the rules. So if, if people want to be corrupt, then they, they always will. And having automated decisions makes it, or I believe makes it harder for um, to consider individual problems and individual issues. Um, so I disagree on the goal. Um, to answer the question, well, at the end of the day, um, anyone involved in chat GPT or something similar, artificial intelligence, which is full of physicists and mathematicians, is involved in that in some way. But it's nothing I'd encourage people to to work on because I don't think it's a good good concept. Um, and the second question on Angela Merkel's role, it's a hard one because I was fairly young when these decisions were made in Germany and I wasn't involved that much in politics. What I think helped though is that as a physicist, so in, in Germany, um, we stopped research or we, we, we stopped our nuclear energy program in 2000, was it 11 or 10, right after Fukushima? Um, and Angela Merkel, unlike most other politicians, was able to understand the physics of what happened and the probabilities of this happening in other places and the risks of this happening. Um, and maybe her ability for no bullshit logical thinking gave her the or helped her see the window of opportunity that the Fukushima incident opened in German politics to shut down nuclear energy. Um, yes, but no, but yes. Thank uh, you very much. That's my answer. Thanks. Um, I think we should stop now because we're 10 minutes uh, overboard. But um, thank you very much for this nice talk. And we hope to hear from you again soon. <laughs> thank you very much for, for joining the talk and for your questions and for your time. I enjoyed it a lot. And I wish you a very good continued seminar and good talks into other fields. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hay galletas. Hay. <laughs>